All right, we can start by turning to Philippians chapter 4. And there is a point to the talk tonight, which is always good. So, um, Philippians chapter 4. And verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Um, I employ Euodia and I implore, implore Sintache to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So um, just wanted to start talking to introduce my topic about this strange little mention of um Euodia and Syntyche and some kind of difficulty there in, in the church um and him urging of uh these two people to be of the same mind I actually looked up um and I found this it's actually it's actually they they found them and painted them looks like the first installment of Real Housewives of Philippi um but there was some problem, and I guess it must have been reasonably big to uh, to have reached Paul to write a letter about it, and um, to hear about some disagreement. You know, and often in the in the epistles we we hear about um, some kind of disagreement or someone's gone off the rails or something, but you don't necessarily get all the details, which is probably by design. You probably don't need to know all the gory details of a situation other than that there was this this type of problem and the instruction to come together to to unify and all those kinds of things which probably tells you a lot about how we are to resolve things in the lord but it's not about it's not really about the actual issue and breaking it down it's more about our attitudes of of you know um in honor preferring one another and all that kind of thing and even maybe you know even if you're in the right to to um find a way to come together um and it says in the in the verse um three at the end of verse three it says that their names are in the book of life so we know that this is just this is just sort of um stuff that happens with when there's humans involved it happens to be in the, in a spirit-filled church but um you know we're talking about people who are uh apparently walking on in the lord names in the book of life and uh and yet there was some need to uh to find unity and and to find joy and uh if we um Turn to Acts chapter 15. Apparently in this, uh, this area of Philippi was a, a Roman colony, apparently, and apparently that, um, uh, you know, culturally, um, women were, it was much more like today, you know, culturally for women, you know, being able to do, have freedoms and all that kind of stuff. So um, maybe that sort of uh, that was the scene at the time. And uh, you can also read here. Now, this um, interaction we read here is uh, is actually in the same church that we just read about. So Acts chapter 15 and verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many, hang on a second, hang on. 
I don't think I'm in the right place. Um, going on here? One second, I'll find this. I think it's uh, Acts chapter 16. Um, yes. So we'll start in verse, I guess we'll start in 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So it was a women's prayer meeting. Verse 14, um, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple. Um, and we, we know this story. And it says, uh, verse 15, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay and, and so on. But uh, the point I want to make here is that, again, this Philippi, there's this, um, this uh, women's prayer meeting. Um, and I don't know if those other two women were present, but um, there was obviously, it was obviously a healthy church with with a, an eye on unity, with an eye on prayer, and uh, being uh, being part of a growing church. Now, Phil, back to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, and verse two. Um, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so just three quick verses there on, on unity and, um, and just the fact that, yes, we, we're instructed, um, we know how to be unified. And then when there are, um, th there may be cases where um, there needs to be a call to unity, maybe some instruction. And um, the reason why, <clears throat> I guess I'll explain the reason for my talk. I, I, you probably know I went for a work trip recently to the islands of Hawaii and um, just just heard a bit of history there that I, I had no idea of and I think that a lot of people uh, know stuff that I don't so forgive me if you already knew this but um, yes the, I did not expect this like island paradise to be the uh, location of such um, warfare in the past and uh, just yeah I just took a little little tour um, some of the island I was on in a bus and so you hear you know, you see some things and you hear some things and the tour bus driver, she's talking away and she, uh, it, it just went into this, um, this long period of time where she's just describing all this history of Hawaii and it, it's nuts. I couldn't even, could barely remember anything with all the names and, and all that. But, um, yeah, what shocked me was the story she told were one of, so there's, there's eight major islands. There's probably hundreds of other minor islands in Hawaii. And, um, and the story she told was this one of like these eight islands and just con constant war and fighting to, to take over this mm -hmm. island. And then, and then you lose this island and you get pushed back or killed. And, and then there's, you know, this guy's the king and he's trying to, rule as much as he can and then he has sons and then those sons grow up and then they're, they're trying to um 
kill their half brother and like it's all family and if you're part of the same family that doesn't mean anything you know you're still trying to take over i'm obviously paraphrasing a lot because i can't couldn't understand anything really all i could grasp was like we're in paradise here with a few tiny islands and you're telling me for centuries you know i was look i looked up um uh well there's a there's an old picture of the uh of the islands presumably old names and i think that's james cook being killed i forgot that he he died there he was murdered there but i was looking up these these list of these fight these wars and stuff in hawaii starts in the 11th century um you can see the first one so and so and his brothers over land and and you read through these uh these things all these battles these invasions of these tiny little pa island paradises and um just down through the centuries and uh then next page i think around about oh it's more towards the end yeah this is the big one down here um but there's just so much uh just so many revolutions and and trying to it was just like trying to overtake islands and back and forth. And it was just crazy to me. Like you're, you're a small area in the middle of the world, in the middle of nowhere in the ocean. And uh, apparently it was the hardest place to get along <laughs> in the world. Um, <clears throat> so I had no idea about all this. I had no idea it was such a, a history of blood. And um, and uh you know just in this beautiful place that this kind of stuff happens and um just the fact that they were all so close in in proximity in culture they all came from probably the same ancestors and they spoke the same language and yet it was just contention and um We'll turn to Mark chapter six. I guess I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, sort of that, sort of like that that saying, familiarity reads contempt, and and sort of like how you know we live we live in a country. Everyone lives in a country, and you, you think about your politics and your arguments, and you think about a national level, and then a state level, and all the problems, and then the county level, and then and your little neighborhood and you know neighbors fighting about this covenant and you're not cutting your lawn and all this just how there's just no, there's no peace at any level really um because apparently mankind just can't can't do that just can't get along but um jesus spoke about it of course we know uh verse one here mark chapter six says then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him when the sabbath had come he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying where did this man get these things and what wisdom is this which is given to him and such uh, mighty that such mighty works are performed by his hands so this is the, his his locals just uh being skeptics and critical verse three is this not the carpenter the son of mary and brother of James, um, Joseph, and Judas and Simon, uh, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief then he went out uh, he went about the villages in a circuit teaching so jesus talked about this you know he talked about um this idea of you know, maybe even those close to you are, are most against you um, maybe when we talk we think about coming to the lord and the <clears throat> the friction that can happen unfortunately um People don't like change. They don't like, unfortunately, they don't like change for the good, you know. Um, even if you look at spiritual life, the conversion, the, the miraculous things that happen, look at it from a natural point of view. You're, you're already winning, you know. 
um, let alone from the spiritual point of view. Um, I'll just read you a quote from, it's titled Political Warfare in Ancient Hawaii. And it says, um, aspiring young chiefs practice the arts of warfare with great intensity, typically having defeated other chiefs to gain control over one island, a major chief and his warriors would then raid and attempt to conquer other islands. Death of a reigning king always um, meant war. And this is, um, I mentioned it was 1795. This, this was crazy. Uh, you can read up on it. <clears throat> and um, apparently they, I think this is the, the, the people from the island where Honolulu is, they went over to this island and pushed them off a cliff or, or you know, battled them off a cliff. And 100 years later, they found 800 skulls at the bottom of this cliff. And so you look at Hawaii and you may never think of it the same way again. I'm sorry, but you know, all the lush jungles and all that, it's just, it's just war grounds. But, um, I, and it made me think of, um, well, turn to James chapter four, but the part that was sort of a bit closer to what I was doing there. So I was, um, working for a company there essential institution. I don't want to say who it is because we're on YouTube here, but um, they have a presence across all the islands, this business. And so we we're going there to help improve things and uh, fix things and suggest things. And what you end up finding out is that the company is very disjointed and um, not, they don't have good business processes and that um, the, what ended up being evident was that the culture on each island sort of ran through the business and affected how people did business. And um, they just decided to do it however they felt like. And really, you know, in this sort of areas that I work in, you're supposed to have a uniform way of doing things when you're using IT systems, you're supposed to use it the same way so that everything works. And so the CEO can have the visibility into what's going on and it's all good. But what ends up happening is, you know, every island has its own way and a completely disconnected system like no one has any idea what they're doing they're doing they're doing and um it was just interesting to me again just dealing with this pretty small little company how um how it was just a problematic and it's it's going to be for probably quite a while um and so problems arise and you know and I know that the geography there is a bit a bit different, but it sort of makes it even more um, the same problems happen everywhere in the world. But when you have a piece of water between two islands, it seems to really magnify it. It's like when you're on this island and they're on that island, well, that means we're different to them. Um, and so uh, the way things go. And so what's the what's the source of this kind of stuff? Um, you know, is it the circumstances? Is it really? the situation on the ground. If we read in James chapter four, um, James chapter four and verse one, um, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so um, really you hear what it's saying for the purposes of my talk is that um, this discord and disharmony is not a result of real reasons, like real things in front of you, real real things on the ground. It's not, it's not that at all. It's because of your attitude and your view of things um, that sin results. Um, it's not you're blaming your circumstances. You can't you can't do that. Um, and so mankind without the Holy Spirit is just incapable of, you know, I'm generalizing here, but incapable of uh, having peace with his neighbor. We, we see it in the wars um, going on today. We see it in, in crime. We see it in all aspects of life and society. Um, we see that mankind has this missing peace and we know what it is and um and it ends up being this big hole they're trying to fill by chasing all this stuff 
and it never fills the the hole it never fills the gap only the holy spirit can do that and um and once we when we've had that you know when we've had this experience when we have this knowledge of god um it replaces our entire motive for living and all and all this stuff that we just read you know uh we don't have those the lusts and the and the chasing chasing of things and the looking to fill the gap because we've we've got the peace you know through that miraculous um experience and so it's just something you can't manufacture and yet that's what the, the world's trying to do they're trying to find that manufactured peace but it's it, it's not going to work um <clears throat> um let's see Well, Acts chapter 15, oh, I guess that's why I wrote Acts chapter 15 before, but we really will go to Acts chapter 15. And should have stopped sharing this. Um, and ver well, so Acts chapter 15 is an interesting one, um, sort of goes through a, a conflict. So we're talking about divisions and differences and conflicts tonight. And Acts 15 is a, is a good one because it talks about a big conflict between, um, you know, people under the law that, or the Jews and, and Gentiles and, and a conflict over circumcision and, and is that necessary and all that. And um, it actually ends up, where is it? In verse 31, I think actually kind of ends up resolved and, and all good. I think in verse 31, Acts 15 says, when they had read it, meaning the, it's a letter, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So here's a situation where that, there was a problem, there was a difference of opinion and, and it was resolved. And then um, I don't know if it's supposed to be ironic, but in verse uh, 36, we'll read. So everything up until this part of the chapter has been that other problem. And so now we read verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Um, so we're going to go back and follow people up. Verse 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So it's a little bit of a what happened here moment because that's pretty much it. Um, talks about this disagreement. Someone wasn't reliable. So there was this guy they wanted to take. One guy wanted to take, Paul didn't uh, because he sounded like he was just unreliable, didn't show up, you know? Um, and so there was this disagreement and it says there, the contention was so sharp that they, they actually, they, they did the follow-ups, but they <laughs> split and took off. And, um, no, I don't know how you, I don't know how you view it. There's probably, like I said before, uh, you don't necessarily get all the details of the why of these things, but you take from it um, what you can. And one thing is that um, there was actually in, in Timothy, uh, this guy, John called Mark was, was mentioned as being helpful in the ministry. So perhaps things ended up all up, uh, sorry, ended up, you know, resolved. Um, and, and, and the other thing you can take of it, like, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it was fine. Like maybe it was fine that they split up and they had this disagreement and that they went away, you know, they had the right attitude and they truly believed, you know, maybe one guy, uh, was it Barnabas, you know, maybe he believed that in, in forgiveness and a second chance. And he was just all about giving this guy a, another go, you know, sure. He was unreliable one time. And uh, he was all about that. And, and Paul, you know, you know, a probably more demanding guy, I don't know, but um, 
you know, needed to get the job done. I, you know, we can't really say for 100% sure what this situation is, but all we do know is that if you, uh, if each of those guys was, had the right attitude with doing things for the Lord and doing things for the right reason, and, and that, that rift happened, you know, um, maybe it did end up all for good, like I said, in Timothy, but, you know, for us ourselves, we need to be assured when there are, when there are these kinds of things happen. I mean, unless you're deluding yourself, you pretty much know if you're, if you got the right attitude and if you can read the word and see things, uh, in the word that you're, that mirror what you're doing. Am I, am I following the Lord? Do I have the right attitude? Um, that's pretty much all you can do. And even if there is a disagreement, you know, there's even a way to handle disagreement. There's a way to be in disagreement, um, uh, spiritually. So there's all those things and we won't read all those things tonight. Of course, we're pretty much out of time. Um, but yeah, so I guess just some of the nuanced things here with, with differences and, and discord and that kind of thing. Um, just find one to finish up on. Um, probably we'll finish up on Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter two is an interesting one. It just talks about, there's a hostile dividing wall between us. It talks about, again, the Jew versus the Gentile kind of thing and how to, to deal with that. Um, but we'll finish up in uh, Ephesians chapter four. <coughs> and verse one. Um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one. God and Father of all who is above all and through all. And so, you know, the great thing is, this is very important here about this oneness, like we all have the same spirit. We all have the same God because um, a lot of these problems, you know, thinking about ancient warfare in Hawaii of all things, um, it's, they didn't, if they don't have a God, if there's no like power that's, that's more powerful than um, those islands, then how, would, who's right and who's wrong? Like there's no, there's no one to believe in. There's no God. And I'm sure they had um, what were called gods. I, I know one of them was the, um, the female volcano God. I can't start with P, but you know, she's gone off right now on the big Island. And so they had fears and gods and all that, but it seemed to be combined to each of their islands. And, and so, um, it's just praise the Lord that we have this, um, one experience and this one spirit to, to go back to, um, in another translation, it says, um, one of those verses, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of the spirit in the binding power of peace. I like those words because like we should protect this amazing thing we have. Like this is um, a sanctuary from the world that people can come and experience and um, and just, uh, you know, experience the peace of the Lord and, and then, and then know it themselves, um, through what God's got available to them. Um, another ver version of the verse there is, um, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It literally means to work to the point of exhaustion to maintain unity. And so, um, yeah, I guess, um, that's just, you know, and it's sort of even magnify more when you're small. I know there's probably, probably challenges in bigger fellowships as well when, um, you know, you don't know everyone and all that, but, um, when we're small, you know, we all, we probably, probably have a closer bond, um, being in a small fellowship, which is, you know, it sort of forces you to become close. And, uh, we just always want to have understanding and <clears throat> with different situations and different, you know, people have very different situations in our fellowship. And, um, 
and I think if everyone's looking to preserve that unity, um, then that that's why our fellowship's great. That's why we, uh, you know, we love our fellowship. We want to protect it. We're always talking about what are we going to do next? You know, how are we going to grow next? So we'll just leave it there. And um, 